The world is becoming smaller and smaller every day. There was a time a few centuries ago when people were still seeking new routes between Asia and Europe and discovering new lands. But in the last few decades, not only could you travel to any part of the world in a day or two, but we are also digitally connected to millions of strangers every day thanks to all the satellites roaming in Earth's orbit. However, the past wasn't as isolated as history usually portrays. In fact, we are learning more and more about ancient globalization with new discoveries and decryptions of ancient text. We often learn about a lot of Greco-Roman explorers who traveled around the known world back then, but what about people who traveled to Rome from other places? Asia, to be exact. Welcome to Nutty History. Today, we're looking back at Asian sailors, merchants, and explorers who visited and perhaps lived in ancient Rome. The Origins of Silk Road International trade in the Bronze Age was more of a network chain than a direct contact. For example, the Minoans would trade with the Phoenicians, the Phoenicians would trade with the Hittites, and the Hittites would trade with the Egyptians, who in turn would trade with the Kushites and the Nubians, and that's how the Minoan pottery would get to the heart of Africa without Minoans and Nubians directly ever meeting. However, the fall of the Bronze Age expanded the reach of everyone to their neighbor's neighbors. And bam, a few centuries down the line, Alexander the Great decided that he would go as far east as the land would allow him and achieve something unprecedented for the time. His armies crossing the Indus River remained the most successful campaign in the Indian subcontinent from the west for more than a millennium. Even though Alexander succumbed to his wounds and possibly to the scheming of his betraying allies, his efforts to create the largest empire did make the world a little smaller for all the kingdoms, empires, and civilizations of the time. Alexander may have never reached China, but the roads he traveled in Central and South Asia helped to connect a pathway to China. Trade existed from China to Central Asia and back even before Alexander. However, his campaign expanded the reach of the trade route to Europe. A couple of centuries after Alexander, something incredible happened. In the West, the expanding reach of Rome, despite its failing democracy and Crassus's folly, eventually eliminated all the Hellenistic kingdoms and took control of the Eastern Mediterranean and Egypt as it transcended into imperialism. In the Far East, pretty much around the same time, the Han Dynasty defeated the troublesome Shangnu nomads that had kept Chinese expansion at bay on the Northwest Front. China took over control of the vital Gansu Corridor and the transcontinental route that led west towards Fergana Valley through the Pamir and Hindu Kush passes connecting them directly to Persia and the Mediterranean coast. This route was what would be named by the west as the iconic Silk Road. The Chinese fabric was an instant hit in the city of long flowing togas. By the first century CE, silk was such an in-demand commodity in Rome that according to Pliny the Elder, the Senate was worried that the city was spending too much money on imported fabric. They tried to ban it, and they got support from the conservative Romans, too, who were moaning about the revealing nature of silk worn by Roman women. But the tax money and a concern for revolt made the Senate back down. Yet, despite the huge demand for Chinese silk, art tapestries, fireworks, and spices, the direct contact between the two countries was pretty much next to impossible. It is probable that one or two Chinese wandering merchants may have reached Rome and sold their products in a Roman agoras, but if they did, there is unfortunately no record for such merchants because of several reasons. The most important reason was that they weren't royal convoys, so they got no attention from the important people. Second, the language barrier must have made it difficult for them to establish proper communication. And thirdly, the journey from China was not only incredibly long, if not a year or two, but definitely several months. It was also perilous. The Parthian ambushes, white hot dunes, brutal winds, wildfire, and you always had to watch out for bandits and pirates, because there's always bandits and pirates when China reached out to Rome. In the first century CE, Han forces annexed the Tarim kingdoms located south of Fergana, thus becoming neighbors with an old Roman enemy, Parthia. The general of the Chinese army, Ban Chao, reported to his emperor about his interactions with the merchants that were using the Silk Road to reach the Roman Empire. He described the Roman Empire to the emperor as Da Qin, or Greater China, establishing that Rome was a state of considerable power. Later, with the Chinese emperor's approval, Bao Chan dispatched an ambassador named Gan Ying to Rome and learned more about them. The lack of direct contact between Asian kingdoms and empires in Rome was Parthia's paranoia and control over the western section of Silk Road. Given that Rome and Parthia were always battling for control over the Mediterranean, the Parthian Empire was not keen on allowing an alliance between Rome and the Indian subcontinent or the Chinese Empire. 
The Chinese convoy was hoping to establish direct communication with Rome and, with their support, break the Parthian control over trade on the Silk Road. This is why Ganying's convoy had to sneak their way across the Parthian territory to get to the Persian Gulf. From there, they could simply follow northwards and find their way into the Roman Empire's border in Syria. After that, it was only a matter of making the authorities understand who they were and why they were here despite the language barrier, and they would end up on a ship to Rome. But ditching the Silk Road meant they had to rely on shoddy information about how to get to Rome by other means. Their report mentioned that the Chinese believed Rome lay somewhere northwest of the Indian Ocean, so Gan Ying planned to sail around Arabia to Rome and Egypt. Not a great plan, but not exactly a bad plan either if they knew what they were doing. Spoiler alert, they didn't know what they were doing. Not only did they choose the worst time to go sailing in terms of weather and other sailing conditions, but they weren't even allocated enough money to embark on such a long marine journey. Gan Ying had to abandon his mission only after touching the Roman Empire's borders, and that was all that is known about the Chinese reaching out to meet Rome. Still, Gan Ying's convoy brought back a lot of secondhand information about the Roman Empire to China. One of the things they learned was that Romans were aware of China and called their country Ceres, which means the land of silk. Gan Ying's presence in Roman territory did cause some ripples as a Roman convoy came looking for Ban Chao in Eurasian steppes around 100 BC. From the Land of Gold If you're wondering why China didn't take direct route from their own ports to Rome, the answer to that question is the Malay Peninsula that worked as an impassable barrier itself, but also the waters in that region were full of pirates. Even Romans who tried to sail their way in Asia couldn't get farther than the India and the Indochina Peninsula because of the same reason. In fact, the Roman Empire was quite keen on establishing a direct maritime route to the Indian subcontinent by bypassing the Parthians in the Middle East. Roman historian and geographer Pliny the Elder called India the sink of the world's gold and wrote in detail about the craze Romans had for Indian spices, sculptures, woven fabric, and jewelry. The earliest record of an Indian ambassador traveling to Greco-Greco-Roman world comes from the 3rd century BC when Mauryan Emperor Ashoka sent two of his children, a son and a daughter, to various countries to promote and spread Buddhism, even though Ashoka predates the Roman Empire by a couple of hundred years. The initiative by Ashoka opened the channel of contact between Europe and India. It is highly likely that many Buddhist monks from the Indian subcontinent later traveled to Rome to continue Ashoka's mission as Buddhism was flourishing in the Italian peninsula. Even today, Buddhism is the third most practiced religion in Italy, as 0.3 of its population are Buddhist. It is quite possible that the religion might have had a larger following in ancient Rome, before the persecution of pagans began after the Christianization of ancient Rome. The Buddhist monastery that existed near Esquiline Hill certainly supports the probability. But the direct contact between the Roman Empire and the Indian subcontinent was established with Augustus' win over Ptolemaic Egypt. The Indian subcontinent and Ptolemaic Egypt had exchanged ambassadors definitively since the establishment of the Mauryan Empire. And it is quite possible that Mauryan ambassadors traveled to Rome as well, but unfortunately the records of such contacts have been lost to time. Cassius Dio mentioned in his History of Rome that many ambassadors from different corners of the Indian subcontinent arrived in Rome to honor Augustus when he became the new overlord of Egypt. They brought with them performers, dancers, painters, and poets to make a grand presentation to propose an alliance with the Roman Empire. They concluded their offers with gifts in the form of handicrafts, jewelry, perfumes, and many animals, with the royal Bengal tigers being the highlight. Not just Romans, but perhaps Greeks too, saw them for the first time, and their jaws dropped in awe of the magnificence of the rightfully titled the King of the Jungle. However, when it comes to the names of these esteemed guests from India, historical records once again fall short. We hardly know any of them properly. One was from the Peru Kingdom, which was located in modern West Punjab, Pakistan, who brought letters written from his king in the Greek language along with exotic pets, such as monos, tigers, and pythons. The embassy from Kushans that ruled the northern Indian subcontinent perhaps presented Augustus the coins depicting Roman and Indian gods side by side. The idea would have been to depict that if their gods can exist harmoniously, then so can the empires. The embassy from Broach, which would have been situated in the northern Gujarat state of West India, was accompanied by a Buddhist monk named Germanos, or Germano. The Chera Kingdom in South India built a temple in honor of Augustus. Their embassy probably presented a miniature sculpture of the building to Augustus decorated with gemstones, silver, and gold. The Pandya Kingdom, which ruled modern Tamil Nadu state and most of South India, also sent their prime minister as the embassy to Augustus in 20 BC, along with precious stones, pearls, and an elephant. The Romans called him Kalanos, which may have been derived from the Tamil word Kalan, which means the prime minister. 
Asian plus Indian trade buddies. The reason behind such a painstaking endeavor to appease Augustus by ancient Indians was trade. Egypt had been the biggest importer of Indian goods for centuries, and that trade only flourished under the rule of the Ptolemy dynasty when boom when Romans took over. According to Gallus, the first prefect of Egypt under the rule of Augustus, 120 vessels were going back and forth between Indian ports and the Ptolemaic Red Sea ports. A single consignment from the Chera Kingdom in South India to Alexandria consisted of around 1,500 pounds of nard, about 5,000 pounds of ivory, and nearly 800 pounds of textile. Now, the cost of this consignment was around 131 talents. A talent is about 30 kilograms of gold, and in today's worth, that consignment must have been worth about 45 million U.S. dollars, roughly, enough to buy 2,400 acres of land in ancient Egypt. But here's the astonishing part. A Roman cargo ship was capable of carrying 150 consignments of such quantity. That means every season, Roman Egypt imported 18,000 consignments of that value from India. No wonder Piney thought India was hoarding all the world's wealth. And to be honest, Romans didn't mind such trade either, as a 25% tax was levied on all goods from India, so Indian trade was literally a golden goose for them. Through India, Rome also established trade routes deeper in Asia, such as the Indochina Peninsula, where Roman ships landed for the first time in South Vietnam in the 2nd century CE. As these countries had active trade with Indian kingdoms, it is quite possible that Southeast Asians were also tagging along on the Indian vessels in travels to Roman Egypt, bringing their exotic spices and bamboo with them. The people who created the Romans' grape wine. Apart from trade, the cultural exchange also strengthened the relations and diplomacy between the Indian subcontinent and the Roman Empire. The myth about the Roman god of wine, Bacchus, featured the god's adventures in India long before Alexander reached India. One version depicts Bacchus growing up in India, hiding from his stepmother Juno, the wife of Jupiter. The other version presents him as the conqueror of western India. Now, both versions propagate that Bacchus brought Indian traditions of festivities and celebrations to the Greco-Roman world and gifted India grapes so they could also make their wine. Hindu shrines existed in ancient Rome near the Circus Maximus as well as in Pompeii, among many other cities, which means that Hindu Indians were living back then in these cities. Next to the ruins of a large dye house in Pompeii, archaeologists discovered an incredible figurine in 1938. Under the rubble of igneous rocks, a bejeweled statue was found of an Indian goddess adorned in jewelry, but no clothes. This statue depicted goddess Luxmi, the goddess of beauty and wealth in the Hindu pantheon. Most likely, this dye house belonged to an Indian resident who dyed Roman clothes in indigo color. Now, it's not obvious, indigo got its name for being imported from India. The merchants of India were thrown together in one class by the Indian society called the Vaishya community, and those who traveled overseas were called Pani, which also coincidentally sounds quite similar to Phoenicians in Roman adaptation. However, the Indian diaspora in ancient Rome wasn't limited to only merchants. It is believed that Indian scholars of multiple fields, such as astronomy, mathematicians, art, architecture, sculpture, minting, and philosophers, visited or stayed in either Rome itself or at least in various corners of the Grand Roman Empire, and their works definitely reached Rome. If you enjoyed the video, Please hit the like button and share our video with your friends and family. It will support us and we'll make more videos like this one. And if you want to watch them, click the subscribe button and the bell. Thanks for watching Nutty History.